A very warm welcome to everyone to this special on averting a cyber pandemic. This is the fourth day of the Davos Virtual Week. During this session, we will discuss how the COVID-19 pandemic dramatically increased the de de dependence of economies and societies on digital technology, increased the vulnerabilities of individuals, businesses, and governments. And the goal is to examine the lessons of this pandemic and, and, and identify steps to prepare for a better future global response to cyber attacks. To kick off our session, we will play a brief video on a potential cyber pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has shaken our economies and societies to the core and shown us how vulnerable we are to biological threats. In the digital world, similar risks are being overlooked right now. A cyber attack with COVID-like characteristics would spread faster and further than any biological virus. Its reproductive rate would be around 10 times greater than what we've experienced with the coronavirus. To give you an idea, one of the fastest worms in history the 2003 Slammer Sapphire Worm doubled in size approximately every 8.5 seconds, infecting over 75,000 devices in 10 minutes and almost 11 million devices in 24 hours. Fortunately, at least until now, cyber attacks have not impacted our health the way pandemics have, but the economic damages and therefore the impact they have had on our daily lives have been equal and sometimes even greater. You see, the only way to stop the exponential propagation of a COVID-like cyber threat is to fully disconnect the millions of vulnerable devices from one another and from the internet. All of this in a matter of days. A single day without the internet would cost our economies more than 50 billion US dollars, and that's before considering the economic and societal damages should these devices be linked to essential services, such as transport or healthcare. As the digital realm increasingly merges with our physical world, the ripple effects of cyber attacks on our safety just keep on expanding at a faster pace than what we're preparing for. COVID-19 was known as an anticipated risk. So is the digital equivalent. Let's be better prepared for that one. The time is now. A great video to set the stage for our discussion this afternoon. Uh, I would like to introduce our excellent panel uh, we have David Koh, Commissioner of Cybersecurity and Chief Executive Officer, Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. As a commissioner, he has the legal authority to investigate cyber threats and incidents and to ensure essential services are not disrupted in the event of a cyber attack. We have Michelle Price, Chief Executive Officer of Cyber from Australia. Or Cyber was established in 2017 as part of the Australian government's Industry Growth Centers Initiative. Uh, Welcome, Michelle. We have Gil Chue, the Chief Executive Officer, Checkpoint Software Technologies, a cybersecurity company headquartered in Israel. Mr. Chue is also an inventor and holder of industry patent for stateful inspection technology. And finally, we have Clara Saab, Senior Fellow, Atlantic Council Digital Forensic Research Lab, and a member of the Forum's Global Shapers Hub in Washington, DC. She is dialing in from Taiwan, in her previous roles, she's been a senior advisor for emerging technology at the US Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, chief technology officer at the US Department of Homeland Security's Countering Foreign Influence Task Force and US Interagency Countering Violent Extremism Task Force. A great panel, welcome to all of you. This public panel discussion will last for 30 minutes and will be followed by a more detailed discussion that is limited to forum members and partners. I will quickly move to the discussion now. Uh, as a broad question to all of you to think about, let me first pose uh, the, the, the query that what is cyber pandemic for you? From your own perspective, what does it mean? How similar, similar is it to a viral pandemic? How different it is to what we've experienced over the last year? And importantly, what could we do about it if it was to um, emerge in our midst. Uh, specifically, let me first turn to David. David, after observing the last year's response to the pandemic, how did that change your work and your thinking in protecting a nation, especially its critical infrastructure? What are the kind of policies do you think are required for the future? And will policies keep pace with evolution of technologies or will we always be playing catch up? Thank you, Samir, and uh, WEF. 
for inviting me to speak uh, at this session of averting a cyber pandemic uh, and for that great video. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated digitalization dramatically. Technology has done wonders to keep us connected. Uh, this panel is a great example of that. It's also a product, it's also aided our work and how we entertain ourselves. Uh, additionally, during the lockdown periods, the digital space is an enabler for all sorts of activities. For instance, we see remote working, e-commerce becoming a new way of life. All of this have increased our reliance on digital infrastructure at an unprecedented scale. And it's also expanded our view on what essential services should consist of. I don't think many of us thought supermarket uh, delivery or food delivery services were essential until we had a lockdown. The operating landscape has evolved. The digital domain and cyberspace have now become the lifeblood of our economic and social lives. The attack surface has also increased exponentially. Our policies therefore have to change in order to keep in tandem with these developments. The pandemic is an issue that plagues the physical world, but the cyber pandemic is a crisis in the digital world. I see some similarities in the approaches that we can take to manage these two types of pandemics. Well, first, in both situations, there is a need for collective responsibility. In dealing with cyber threats, different segments of the community need to work together to engender an environment of security and trust in the digital domain so that we can optimize the full potential of the digital economy and society. So for instance, governments can contribute by putting in place national strategies and initiatives to increase the broad level of cyber hygiene for all internet users. Um, to this end, in Singapore, we have launched a Safer Cyberspace Master Plan last year with the aim of going beyond protecting just the critical information infrastructure and provide some basic level of cybersecurity for the whole of society. Beyond governments doing their part, there's also a role for industry partners, as well as enterprise and individual end users to play. We encourage in industry partners to prioritize their customers' interests. Um, example to secure by design practices in the provision of digital products and services. Enterprise and individual end users also need to have basic awareness of the types of cyber risks that are out there and the measures that they need to take to better protect themselves. It's not just a technical issue, end user awareness uh, is also essential. Second, David, I, hi. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Complete, uh, complete your point. Hyper-connect, hyperconnectivity in the digital and physical realms also pose challenges to dealing with cyber and public health pandemics, respectively. So this requires close cooperation between various stakeholders to deal with the pandemic. In the case of cyber, the level of interdependence between organizations through the supply chains mean that Compromise of a single supplier will generate ripple effects. The recent SolarWinds cyber breach is an example. So even an organization with good defenses can be vulnerable when threats come from third-party vendors. So given the challenges of hyper-connectivity, we need to work together. And it's, of course, uh, cross-boundary, uh, international, etc. Third, the threat that we have to deal with in cyber and the public health pandemic is rapidly evolving. So our responses need to be agile to keep uh, in step with the changing nature of the threat. We hear about new variants in COVID virus, similar in cyber, they are constantly evolving threats and sophisticated threat actors. So we need to have mindset shifts. We need to engender a shift, for example, from compliance to risk, assess as risk assessments. If you just have a rigid compliance mindset, it won't work when the threats are evolving. Uh, enterprise security postures need to be constantly reviewed and updated. So one example is to move to a mindset of a zero trust cybersecurity model. Two key principles to this, don't trust any activity in the network without verification. And secondly, we need to monitor for suspicious activities. So in sum, averting a cyber pandemic requires collective responsibility, close cooperation between stakeholders and forward-looking mindsets. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you. Let me also quickly uh, uh, reach out to all who have joined us uh, this afternoon. If you have queries, please post them on the chat box and we will bring them into the conversation. Uh, let me go to Michelle Price uh, and, and actually use David's um, uh, idea of collaboration um, and, and kind of rephrase it for you. Australia recently <laughs> announced the Quad Tech Network. 
where several countries will collaborate to build a cross-border cybersecurity ecosystem, hopefully. What benefits are you expecting this collaboration to bring? And how are you managing to work across borders on sensitive technologies? Oh, thanks, Sue. Such a great question. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to Down Under as you traverse the accents that we've got on this fantastic panel this morning, this evening, wherever you happen to be. And a big shout out to Vikram Sharma from Quintessence Labs, who I know has joined us from Australia as well, uh, a quantum encryption company that is part of Ossiba's portfolio. Uh, so the Quad Tech Network, uh, a really big announcement that was made uh, in this part of the world at the end of last year by the Australian government. And what it actually is, if you haven't had the chance, colleagues, to uh, to learn more about it. Uh, it's a network between Australia, the United States, India and Japan to focus on collaboration around research and think tanks to be able to have, I guess, an arm's length conversation from governments about some of the very sensitive issues that we're all dealing with as we try and sort of come to terms with the role of cybersecurity in critical technologies but of course, the common language around what critical technologies means to us all is something that's still very rapidly evolving. Uh, and when we bring uh, the sort of very important role of cyber as the enabler across te critical technologies, not just in terms of being able to ensure trust, but also increasingly to help assure availability uh, in all of these technologies, I think where we're sort of focusing on now is um, the very important aspect of how we need to build different kinds of collaborations around these issues. All of us would know uh, if we're working in the day-to-day -day of cybersecurity, which most, if not all, on this um, session would be doing, uh, sharing sensitive information, in particular sensitive information around the development of new technologies that we have a sense will become critical technologies, uh, especially when they can provide strategic advantage not just economic advantage, it's incredibly hard to trust not just who we're sharing that information with, but how we're sharing it. So we all know those kinds of elements. And, and so this quad tech network is really about saying, we need to have some different ways of collaboration as David referred to before, and that it's not just up to governments, and it's not just up to the private sectors to work with each other either. Of course, we know that public-private partnerships are critical to successful collaboration in cybersecurity and beyond. But one of the really important aspects from a policy point of view that often gets overlooked in the sort of broader collaboration sense is that role of think tanks in particular. And I'm really pleased to see that we are having a role specifically identified for think tanks. And I know that Clara will talk more to this as well. Um, and I think what's really important from a collaboration point of view uh, to the question, uh, the second part of the question as well, is this notion of trusted markets. Uh, and so what we've been looking at at Ossiber from the, the sort of position of being able to generate industry around cybersecurity and the concurrency that cybersecurity has across economies is this notion of trusted markets. If we really do want to take a secure by design approach, not just in how we might uplift legacy systems, how we might deal with the complexities of today, but how we also use the blank sheet of paper that is available to us with emerging technologies as they become critical technologies to take that secure by design approach. The humans involved need to have some kind of assurance around how we do trust those technologies. And so trusted markets is something that is becoming increasingly common in discussions in Australia, in this part of the world. And of course, we know it's a big feature of Five Eyes conversations as well. Uh, but really, it's not, again, just limited to policy. It's how we implement the norms of business against the norms of policy making that help us understand how a trusted market might be something that we can use, not just in a supply chain way, but in a value chain way to be able to get our heads around how we can better collaborate. Because I would contend that, of course, uh, to the points that David was making, as I close my remarks, I'll throw it out there. I think we are living a cyber pandemic right now. I genuinely do believe that just because we don't see the same kinds of kinetic impacts that we've been seeing over the past 200 odd years of our lived experience around uh, health related pandemics, the massive increase that we saw of attacks happening and who they were being leveraged at over the past or aimed at over the past 12 months. In Australia is one example, and I know that this is happening across most economies in the world. We've seen for the first time on mass the targeting to small and micro businesses and not just to leverage their infrastructure to be able to pass through to get to a bigger destination. Those businesses are the targets. 
And so when we look at that in the fabric of that context of what the video gave us at the beginning of uh, the session, I would suggest we're actually living a cyber pandemic right now. So I'd love to talk about that a bit more. I do throw that out to be slightly controversial because not everyone believes that that's what's happening. When we look at the economics of it, when we look at the impacts on everyday lives, I believe we are. Thanks, Sabine. So let me take that to Gil straight away. Gil, we are in the middle of a cyber pandemic, but let me ask you, how did the other pandemic impact your business? How did it impact your customers' business? How did it change your threat assessments, your threat landscape? And are your clients behaving differently today? Uh, first, uh, thank you everyone for this opportunity. Thank you, Samir. Um, I, I think that we are, in, I don't know if I would call it a cyber pandemic because it doesn't stop our life like the biological pandemic that we are, but we're definitely under massive attack every day from multiple sources, from commercial sources, from criminal sources, from uh, other governments that are trying to poke in into our infrastructure. And uh, that's a daily situation that we are in. Uh, on one hand, we are seeing that these attacks are quite successful. On the other hand, we are fighting them and it doesn't stop the entire economy at that moment. But what we know is that that can happen. That can turn into a cyber pandemic like the biological pandemic that we are facing right now. And I think you had an excellent movie explaining that at the beginning, so I don't need to go through all the principles. Maybe the one thing I can add to that is that the dealing with it will be very, very different. I mean, if in the dealing with biological pandemic, we have human beings and we have a health system. We're dealing with other types of attack. We have police and we have defense forces that are human and that can react to human. In a cyber pandemic, we're to we need to talk about uh, computers uh, defending against other computers. And we don't always have that infrastructure because we don't have the time and we don't have the people to deal with it. I mean, the scope of a cyber pandemic, the speed is something that human being cannot react to. So I think our focus should be on building uh, the infrastructure that will protect us in real time, that will can adapt in real time. We call it, by the way, the fifth generation of attacks. Most organizations, and for all the listeners here, it's very likely that your organization is using today what we call Gen 3 technology to protect itself. That's usually not enough because we're in the middle of a Gen 5 storm of attacks. And the latest attacks that we've seen are all fifth generation, very sophisticated, polymorphic, very hard to detect. Think about the coronavirus that we are seeing now but with every attack is a new mutation. Not every week, a few weeks there's a new mutation, but every single attack is different. Looks different, even though it's using the same similar mechanism. So we are do, dealing with attacks that are like that. And what we, I think what we are building, I don't want to be self-promoting, but what the world still doesn't use and still doesn't have is the infrastructure to protect itself in real time. So when we actually see something, we can not just detect it, most of the world today knows how to detect certain types of attacks, but we actually prevent the attack uh, from the zero attempt. And we scale that knowledge to everyone around the world so we can effectively block attacks on, and again, on every scale. If it's a small attack, big attack on one nation, on the entire world, that's the infrastructure that we need and that's what we are trying to build right now. Uh, uh, you know, Gil made an important um, observation that uh, we are playing catch up when it comes to technologies to respond to attacks uh, invented through technological means. And I think that's an important point, and I'll come to that a bit later. But Clara, uh, how do you visualize a cyber pandemic unfolding? Uh, are you also of the opinion that we are in the middle of one? But what we have also seen is uh, for sure an infodemic unfolding fake news, post-truth world, misinformation, synthetic data. Uh, how can private sector, government, and communities collaborate to respond to these uh, multiple challenges that uh, today uh, we are confronting? Yeah, first off, it's such a pleasure to be here um, and speak with such an esteemed set of panelists. Um, I definitely want to zone in on the info pandemic, which is a whole nother issue very much tied to cyber. Um, 
And, um, you know, I will start with, you know, very U.S. perspective because that's where I'm from. Um, today, more than 75 percent of Americans are online with more and more personal information and data uploaded per minute to the cloud. The U.S. has also had a significant supply chain problem with the COVID-19 pandemic and such. Most people are working from home. You know, I know in Asia that there's a lot more people actually going back to offices. But today in the U.S., most people, even large companies, are working from home using insecure networks uh, that they share, you know, Wi-Fi networks they share with the rest of their family. And a lot of companies, especially smaller businesses, are not adequately prepared. I think one of the biggest similarities I see between the physical pandemic and the virtual one is it attacks the most vulnerable groups in any society. Um, you see seniors, the most vulnerable, being most susceptible to fake news online, clicking on clickbait content, and often falling for scams that create huge vulnerabilities in their IoT systems. The same goes for their vulnerabilities um, to the COVID pandemic. And so I think we have to think about you know, vulnerable groups in, in similar ways as well. Um, but to touch upon what others have already said, supply chain um, is really the core, I think, of 2021 and this year. Um, it's really how do we think about the cyber pandemic in a supply chain lens. Um, and when we think about supply chain, the one thing that I don't think other panelists have covered is really the talent gap. So um, I'm a disinformation researcher, and I actually joined U.S. government through a program at the White House that brings top entrepreneurs and technologists to do a term of service. And I have a lot of friends in Silicon Valley. Um, today, only 3% of federal tech workers in the U.S. are under the age of 30, with around 50% of the federal workforce actually going into retirement soon. And in 2019, I worked with uh, the first director of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency, Chris Krebs, to stand up the agency, where we saw a huge gap in talent uh, that was there to, to have a workforce that was ready. And without a talent pool ready, it's very impossible to, to resolve any kind of major cyber issue. Um, and it was very shocking to me going into U.S. government to see the amount of vulnerabilities, uh, the lack of training, the lack of um, ability for a lot of federal workers to really understand how to use IT in a safe and secure way. And we are as strong as our weakest link, right? Um, so private-public partnership is so important. Um, and um, more important now than ever, especially thinking about how do we do that for federal workers. And that extends to every single country where a lot of the federal workforce is, is seniors and older populations that are using the same IT systems that we are. The same extends to businesses today that have never been online, um, that are most hurt. There are small businesses that are trying to do food delivery online, and they're trying to use IT systems for the first time. Um, and they are also especially vulnerable. Um, to expand upon the content and infodemic side, um, you know, it's propelled the pandemic significantly. Um, you can imagine COVID misinformation um, and figuring out whether you should or should not wear masks uh, and disinformation spreading about um, conspiracy theories around mask wearing. Those are, those are examples of where it can actually exaggerate a physical pandemic. Um, what's been really interesting to actually watch the last few years is around this topic of the info pandemic, there's a new breed of um, there's a new breed of career technologists coming out called open source researchers. Um, they've been around for a long time, but you know we've seen a lot of these open source researchers, especially in think tanks and in places like the Digital Forensic Research Lab, being able to identify uh, different kinds of info campaigns that state-backed actors are, are acting upon and playing a critical, wor a critical role working with major cybersecurity companies, major social media companies, and are also working with governments. And I think seeing that explosion of so many great people that want to play a role in really ensuring the cyber hygiene of the internet is, is so wonderful and heartwarming um, for me. Um, one of the things that um, was also especially challenging in the U.S. was, you know, uh, one, one sub example is really around election security, which I think paints a lot of picture about a cyber pandemic we faced, where you not only had um, something that, you know, we now deem a critical infrastructure announced, but you had, uh, you had some vulnerabilities around physical security and disinformation around whether physical systems were secure. Um, in 2015, you know, the Ukraine power grid was hacked. And imagine, uh, you know, the, the kinds of supply chain uh, consequences um, that happened. And that's something that happened in 2018, 2020, was a lot of people online having distrust in physical systems, even if it was secure, that 
that info pandemic, that disinformation has had huge impact in the ability of everyday people to trust a system that is secure. And I think this is going to be the biggest challenge ahead is, okay. is really thinking about how to, how to resolve that. Thank you, Clara. I'm going to ask uh, a question to all of you to wrap up this uh, public session. Uh, if someone has a question to ask from the, um, the viewers, please do type it in. I'll try to bring it in. But my question to all of you, I felt that there was a degree of optimism on, on the world being able to respond to a cyber pandemic. If you were to take a lesson from the last one year, we sucked. We did very badly in responding to the gravest challenge we have faced. We did not work together. We could not get the governments to move in time. We could not share information. We could not collaborate and share resources. How are you uh, going to work in a life situation? What could be the new ideas of responding to a faster moving challenge that the cyber pandemic is likely to be? I'm going to give you all 30 sec seconds, starting with David. David, 30 seconds. I think that's a great question. I, I... Well, it's half full, half empty. I'll share the experience that we have from... 30 seconds. Only 30 seconds. Right. So in ASEAN, we have managed to get uh, the um, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, 10 countries, different uh, uh, degrees of uh, economic development to work together. So recently at the ASEAN Digital Ministers meeting, they've agreed that cyber is a key enabler for the digital future. And we have, we have agreed to set up a CERT, ASEAN CERT uh, Information Sharing um, uh, mechanism. So this is a small step, but it just shows you that uh, even countries as disparate as the 10 countries in the Association of Southeast Asians can come together, recognize that this is a common threat, and work together. Uh, I think that's hope. Michelle? Public-private partnership, it just has to be part of the solution here. And uh, building off what David just said, I think that we also need to remember that there is a huge amount of talent, um, you know, to use Clara's word there, sitting in small businesses. They are so close to the coalface on all of these issues. We need to be listening to them a lot more, and we have the mechanisms to be able to do that. And I'm hopeful that as part of the kinds of forums uh, that David just described and the Quad Tech Network and beyond, we've got a lot of this inf uh, knowledge infrastructure now to be able to leverage those voices as well. Michelle, quick question to you. Do you believe citizens trust enterprises enough to have the... Uh, to create the framework for the response you're suggesting? I think uh, citizens are going to be increasingly, citizens of the world are going to be increasingly moving with their fingers, not with their feet so much anymore, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, I don't think that necessarily trust is being viewed in the same way that it, it was once upon a time. And I think we need to really examine what our definitions are around these things and have an open conversation about what trust really truly means in a digital world, because we keep assigning the same definitions from the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s to the current world that we're in. It's so different. Uh, so I do think that there is enough trust in the ways in which technology are being applied. There's just probably not enough trust in the way that they're being developed and the way that governments withhold information around how technology is developed. And then, of course, the regulatory process is also something that undermines citizen trust. But I think because there is a lot of use in the application of technology, uh, we need to leverage that and leverage the psychology behind that. So your that short answer is that we don't know yet. Deal. We don't know yet, no, but I think that there is enough of a groundswell. <laughs> Gil, 30 seconds to you. Um, I think first, uh, the, the good news is over the last year, our dependence on the internet, on cyber uh, was huge. And the internet and cyber, we stood that. And we've seen amazing attacks. We've seen huge attacks and we survived. Are we ready for the future? Not quite yet. I think we can do much better. I think we need to build much faster infrastructure I think it's not just about collaboration between organizations, and there is good collaboration. I mean, we cooperate with other countries, we cooperate with other companies, we cooperate with our competitors. This forum of the World Economic Forum, the Cyber Forum, is active throughout the year and is helping. So I think the answer is that we need to do much more, and we should be proud of what we've achieved last year because the world moved to the internet and the, the internet survived. And the internet.